Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. If the world is to have any success in tackling global warming, it needs to master carbon capture. The idea is a simple one. Machines simply filter carbon from the air or sources of pollution, such as factory chimneys, and the CO2 is then stored away permanently. Sounds too good to be true? Some environmentalists say it is. Today, we have two experts who say it is a real possibility. And what's more, without it, the world has no chance of stopping catastrophic climate change. Our guests are Dr. Gabriel Walker, an author, academic and climate change strategist based in the UK. Hello, Gabriel. Uh, hello. Hi, how are you? Um, you are also the author of four books, including the um, best-selling book, Hot Topic, how to avoid global warming while still keeping the lights on. We'll talk about that in a bit. And mm -hmm. from Norway, we have joined by Kim Bai Brun. Kim works for a new venture called Northern Lights, which plans to ship and store captured CO2 from across Europe under the North Sea. Hello, Kim. Hello, hello everybody. Thank you both very much for joining us. I'm gonna start with you, Gabriel. Um, a very basic question to start with. Just remind us where we are in terms of global warming. How much CO2 do we emit a year and how much are we doing to curb that at present? Well, um, it's looking good and not so good. I'll tell you the not so good first, which is that uh, we've known about the problem of climate change for, for quite a long time. We've known what uh, greenhouse gases do to an atmosphere and yet we've continued to, to emit uh, with gay abandon. <laughs> And uh, currently it's, of the, it's more than 40 billion tonnes a year of CO2 that are, or, or, and other greenhouse gas equivalents that are being emitted into the atmosphere. And it's not really slowing. So that's the bad news. The good news about it for those of us that live on the earth and like to make our living on the earth is that uh, I think a lot of um, players have belatedly woken up to that. And particularly it's become grown up and mainstream in the corporate world and in the world of finance. And so I think that we're seeing governments, corporations, industries reacting very, very rapidly and spectacularly over just the last 18 months before that, it seemed very slow. And now it's going up what they say is warp speed and accelerating. So action is happening now but emissions are happening now and it's a question which is going to win. Okay, well, we'll come back to um, what industry is doing in, in just a moment, but let's go to you, Kim. Um, I gave a brief overview of what carbon capture is at the beginning, but can you explain in further detail what your group does as well as the company called Climate Climeworks, which I think you're working with and what you're both doing in Norway? So Northern Lights is uh, is a new venture, as you mentioned. Uh, it uh, uh, the company itself was established only a month ago, um, but we have been working on this for many years already. Uh, the owners of this company uh, are large corporations. It's Equinor, Shell, and Total. Uh, and for the last three or four years, uh, we have studied whether it would be possible to store CO two deep underground offshore Norway. And uh, um, we found that that is indeed something that we can do. And um, uh, we found a business model, which is basically that uh, we pick up CO2 from emitters across Europe and ship it to the location where, where it's gonna be stored. And uh, uh, therefore we can call it CO2 storage as a service. Um, it's open and available uh, to, to, to anyone really. And uh, it's, it's the first of its kind, because in the past, uh, there has been a clear link between uh, the emission source uh, and the sink, uh, because you needed to have a pipeline connection. Now, uh, we will use a shipping-based uh, transport solution, uh, which makes it possible uh, to pick it up from anywhere. So it's more flexible. And that is really important, because storage capacity is not available everywhere, uh, but we've got plenty of it in the North Sea. Okay, well, we'll talk about this in more detail. I must say a question does pop in my, up in my head about using um, shipping. Shipping is renowned as a, a, as a global polluter. Um, so I want to know a bit more about that in, in a moment. But can you talk also about the actual capture start of, uh, part of it? You spoke about the storage. Um, you're in partnership with a, a company called Climeworks, an organization called Climeworks. What are they doing? How are they doing it? And why is it new? 
So uh, Climeworks is um, doing direct air capture. Um, uh, and that means that they basically have advanced filters uh, where they um, uh, take CO2 directly from the air. Uh, and through that, uh, we get negative emissions. Uh, so uh, taking CO2 directly from uh, the emission source is, um, uh, is, is going to be important going forward, but it's not going to be enough because there will remain emissions that we cannot abate. And uh, therefore, we need negative emissions, and Climeworks is doing exactly that. So they have advanced um, uh, filters, which basically uh, captures the CO2 directly from the air, uh, and, and then we will be able to pick it up from them and store it. And these filters, just to describe them, they could be put in a sort of giant chimney in a power station, or if you had a steel plant, the, the chimneys coming out of that. Um, can, can you describe how else they might be used? Uh, well, no, so uh, they won't be used like that, actually. <laughs> so uh, these uh, uh, filters, you can basically look at it as a, as a big fan, uh, and, and many of them st stacked on top of each other. And uh, uh, they would typically uh, they can be put anywhere because there is CO2 in uh, the, the air that we, um, uh, that, you know, everywhere really. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the type of uh, filters that you're talking about is, is a very different thing. It, I wouldn't call it filters. It's actually chemical solutions that um, uh, 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 you know, carbon capture on industrial facilities is a very different technology altogether. Uh, but, but, but that's that's also uh, going to be uh, very important. Uh, okay, and probably so the, more the important. distinction about Climeworks is the fact that actually just they're freestanding they're in the air and they can just take CO2 out of the air anywhere. Yes, indeed. OK, that, that, that is quite a big step forward. Um, Gabriel, we were talking about this earlier. You talked about carbon capture as being dual purpose. You talked about um, avoidance and removals. What do you mean by that? Excellent memory. So this is, this is a, I think, a really good way to frame it. Lots of people have become very confused. They talk about carbon capture, they talk about CCS, they talk about negative emissions, and they talk about all sorts of other things, nature-based solutions and all of this. And I think there's a lot of confusion. So I'm just trying to frame it very, very simply. As far as I'm concerned, there are two things that you can do to help solve the climate crisis. One of them is you can stop the problem getting worse. That means you avoid emissions getting into the atmosphere. So you stop them before they get there. That's avoiding it, stopping the problem getting worse. And the other thing you can do is you can take CO2 out of the atmosphere. So that's a removal. And that way, that's not just stopping the problem getting worse. It's actually making it better. So stop it getting worse, make it better. And carbon capture, as, as usually talked about, is for industrial emissions like cement, steel, power stations. You do it in a chimney. And if you've got a chimney with a concentrated amount of CO2, what you're doing is you're stopping that from getting into the air. So that's an avoidance. It's an avoidance, it's stopping the problem getting worse. And that's what many, many different companies are going to need to do that. The whole steel sector, cement, uh, chemical cement is actually responsible for 8% of global emissions. That's, that's something like four, three or four times as much as aviation. And so that's all going to have to be stopped. And there aren't very many solutions apart from carbon capture. And so once you've, once you've captured it, you've got to do something with it. You've got to put it somewhere. And similarly, uh, co companies like Climeworks, and there's a few others doing this as well, can go anywhere in the world with their big fans, they blow the air through these filters, they capture the CO2, and they've caught it from the air, so that's a removal. So avoidance, removal, and in both cases, you've got to put it somewhere. And you've got to put it somewhere where it's going to stay. There's no point in putting it somewhere where it goes back into the air straight away. You've just wasted your whole time. So both of those need some kind of permanent storage. And that rather brilliantly, I think, is where Northern Lights comes in. Because Northern Lights, as Kim can tell us much more about, has got starting to make deals with industrial emitters. We can take your industrial emissions so we can avoid them ever getting into the air. But it's also doing this deal with Climeworks. We can take CO2 from the air and bury it and do that as a service. And both of those can happen at the same time in the same place with Northern Lights. So, uh, Gabriel, what, what has been the solution for big companies? I mean, I, I get the idea that if you're a steel plant um, where you use an enormous amount of energy, it's a bit difficult to rely upon renewables for, for, for that. So, you know, wind, uh, wind or solar are not going to do the trick. And at least for the moment, uh, you are going to be, you know, burning fossil fuels to, to create that intense amount of energy. How, how do we talk about carbon offsets, you know, trying to, uh, you're, you're aiming for, to reduce your emissions or get to carbon neutral. How do companies do that at the moment? 
it, there's more, there's immense confusion over the language, over, over the instruments, over the mechanisms. I'm a very dedicated, I believe in markets and I believe in market mechanisms. And it, it breaks my heart to see what's happening in the whole offset space because there's confusion and there's lack of, there's lack of clarity and there's suspicion about it too. And I understand all the reasons why. And in, in a way, I think that this whole removal space might be able to rehabilitate the concept of these market mechanisms. Because if you think about it this way, offsets kind of traditionally is saying, but let, let's think about it. I put out a ton of CO2, right? And, uh, and, and you put out a ton of CO2. So now the atmosphere has two tons of CO2. That's a bad thing, okay? Next thing, I put out a ton of CO2. I pay you not to do it. There's still a ton of CO2 in the atmosphere. Hmm. How about this? I put out a ton. I pay you to remove a ton. We get back to zero. So that's where offsets in removals actually works as something that you can, you can measure it against. I put in a ton, you took out a ton, we get to the same level. And I think that's where the market mechanism of offsets can be really powerful. If you think about it, offsets, it feels a bit like, you know, the, the plenary indulgences that the church used to sell. You can sort of not feel so guilty, you can expiate your sins. Whereas this isn't anything like that. This is something goes in, something comes out, and we get back to zero. And that's what we're going to need a whole lot more of. Okay. Um, we, we were speaking um, into preparation. This is an area I know very little about, so I, I needed um, some prep on this. And you were talking about, um, I think it was a, a, a couple of um, companies, the amount of pollution they were going to create, the amount of carbon they were going to generate was going to require enormous forests, uh, forests you're saying about the size of Spain. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. Well, you need to ask yourself when you're looking for climate solutions, the first thing is, is it avoidance? Is it removals? We need both. We definitely need both, right? But to do that balancing act, you need removals, right? So is it avoidance or removals? The second question you have to ask is, can it scale? And how much scale is there available? Lots of people say, you know what, plant some trees, you know what, we'll just do it with nature. And you know, that would be great if you, if you could do that. But just two companies in Europe who are actually, who just published their, their plan to get to net zero emissions, to balance off their emissions with removals, have said, we'll plant trees. Now trees do remove CO2 from the air. They are a removal, that's check. It's not avoidance, it's removal. But the scale that they would need, just these two companies, is, is a, a forest the size of Spain. And by the way, they wouldn't be planting it in Spain. That's part of the trouble. They'd be planting it at some other part of the world who also have their requirements. And so why should they be taking up someone else's land? And so that's question two. And while I'm on, on a roll, the third question that you have to ask, so can you scale it? And the, the third question is, how permanent is it? If you're gonna bury carbon, if you're gonna take it out of the atmosphere, it's gotta stay for a long time. We're taking stuff out of the ground that's been there for hundred million years. So you can't have something that's gonna come back out in 10. And, and trees are very temporary. And so that's why we're looking to the kind of geological storage that Kim was talking about, where you can really bury it where the sun doesn't shine and keep it down there. And, and we are, we're gonna need avoidance. We're gonna to need to plant more trees because trees are a good thing anyway, and they also buy us time, but ultimately we're gonna need really substantial amounts of removals and burial in geological scale storage. Um, Kim, you're responsible for government relations for Northern Lights. Can you give us an idea of the variety of views across Europe, for example, or you know, across the world in terms of carbon capture? What, what is the response to it? And in my mind, I'm thinking it's taken us a huge amount of time to get to the level where wind power generates, for example, in the UK as much as a third and a half and sometimes more than nuclear power um, in the UK quite frequently, I think. And so we've obviously made major advances, but that's also been on, I, on the back of subsidies and a huge amounts of financing. So government policy matters, market, markets also matter, but can you just tell us about what the, the sort of variation of government responses to this idea is? So uh, policymakers have been looking at carbon capture and storage for um, a very long time, actually. Um, uh, now, first of all, the technology has been available for decades, so the technology is not new, uh, but, but it's been expensive. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, there was a serious attempt by um, uh, lots of large uh, corporations around the world looking at uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, and uh, um, lots of initiatives uh, started and was launched. Uh, unfortunately, uh, very few of them were successful. And uh, uh, that was uh, uh, because of, of a couple of reasons. So 
first of all, as I mentioned, it is expensive. Uh, and, and the question of, you know, uh, who's going to pay for it came up. Um, uh, national, you know, subsidies will be needed. Uh, and uh, therefore, the policymakers need to uh, kind of prioritize these kind of measures. Uh, and I think only now uh, are, are we really seeing the urgency to do something to stop climate change. Uh, and that's why uh, it's happening now. Uh, 10 years ago, it was probably too early. Then the other thing is uh, the social acceptability of storing CO2 underground. Now, 10 years ago, uh, uh, and, and uh, one of the, the big failures uh, in the attempts was to, to store it uh, onshore. Uh, and uh, onshore storage is, is as safe as storing it offshore. Uh, however, you get the not in my backyard uh, kind of issues. Uh, people don't want CO2 under the ground or under their house. Uh, so uh, uh, that uh, unfortunately didn't really uh, uh, work. Um, now we're looking offshore, at least in Europe. Uh, and, and that certainly helps. Then uh, I, I think thirdly, the technology um, uh, has matured significantly as well and costs have come down uh, and, and that has also uh, helped. It makes it, um, or, or the barriers lower in order to succeed um, uh, both, you know, when, when governments who are, are going to have to fund part of this uh, are looking at what it's going to pay and what is acceptable for the taxpayer, um, uh, it's, it's, it's possible, uh, more possible uh, now. Um, and, and then uh, secondly, also the corporations that are looking uh, at this, they also obviously need to pay uh, a significant part of this themselves. Uh, and, and how can they defend doing that when their competitors are not? Uh, so, so that is uh, also uh, uh, an, an issue, but now the ETS price is going up significantly. Uh, the European trading scheme, uh, that's basically what emitters need to pay uh, uh, for uh, releasing their CO2 into the atmosphere. And uh, the ETS price was you know, only a couple of years ago uh, around 20 euros. Uh, now it's around 40. Uh, and, and, and therefore, you know, uh, uh, emitters are seeing that, hey, you know, <laughs> if, if, if we, uh, if the ETS price is going to continue to go up, uh, which we believe it is, uh, then uh, the, the, this is actually uh, going to be something that can save us money in the future. So the, the, the economy in this is, is, is very important. And we, we can get a bit more into the nitty gritty of the financing in a moment, but just very roughly, are, gov are there governments in Europe that are considering subsidising or in, in offering some form of financial encouragement to those companies that do invest in this or start using these schemes? Yeah, so for example, in Norway, uh, there, there are two, uh, two big emitters, a cement uh, manufacturing um, uh, 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 facility and a waste to energy uh, facility uh, that is is now installing uh, capture on um, uh, on their chimneys basically, um, uh, which means that uh, uh, that uh, they are making significant investments, but they but they would probably not be able to do that without government subsidies. And and in this case, government is is paying around eighty percent of the the, the the total cost. Uh, we are seeing similar schemes in, in other parts of Europe. Uh, UK uh, is uh, very progressive in this area. The Netherlands uh, and various other countries are, are also looking at it. And there are European, uh, the European Union have subsidy schemes as well, uh, something they call the Innovation Fund. And um, uh, now only a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were a number of CCS projects uh, that advanced to, to the second round. It's basically a competition. They need to have good projects uh, and they need to prove significant uh, emission reductions through their projects. But it, it's not only happening in Europe though. You know, Canada has been um, uh, involved in, in, in carbon capture and storage for many years. And, and it's probably one of the most advanced uh, countries when it comes to this. Australia. Okay. Sorry, Kim, do you want to go ahead? So Gabriel, sorry. <laughs> that one's Kim. Um, I was going to say Australia as well. 
um, yeah, as, as some big carbon capture projects. And uh, I was just going to say that I think that one of the, just to add to what Kim was saying about uh, the reasons why it didn't happen last time and seems to be happening more now. And I, I think the, the whole industrial emissions has, has been a game changer as well, because there was a massive amount of focus in the whole climate game on electrification and uh, the power sector, as if the power sector, so, so you, you want to solve climate change, you need, you need renewable uh, electricity and you need electric vehicles and then you solved it. And I think there's this belated realization that actually the industrial sector and the agricultural sector and some others that are much harder to abate are actually very significant. I mentioned earlier that figure of 8% for, for cement on its own. And so the realization too that that, that needs, needs attention has, has focused attention on carbon capture and storage because there aren't very many other solutions. It's not just that you have to burn fossil fuels to get to high temperatures. To make steel, you actually need to use uh, metallurgical coal to just to reduce the steel it's a chemical reaction and when you make cement you're breaking over rocks open rocks that actually releases co2 you can't electrify that away and so you have process emissions that you can't do anything about and then on top of that there's also the the excitement around hydrogen hydrogen is the hot new thing in the whole climate game everyone's favorite new molecule because hydrogen could be a solution for many different things you could use it to transport energy from from one part of the world to another you can you can use it to to, to make steel you can use it in cement you can use it to get to very high temperatures you can use it for heating homes and you can make hydrogen by two different routes one of them is using electro electrolysis and the other one is using carbon capture and storage and so i think that these all these different um all these different uh, uh, developments at once are pointing in the same direction that we need to sort of resurrect this. Uh, For those of us who are not scientists, can you just explain how CO2 storage helps um, hydrogen production? So you can make it out of, you can make it out of water. You can break water apart, you get oxygen and you get hydrogen. And you do that with electricity. Or you can make it out of natural gas. The natural gas has hydrogen in it, but it also has carbon in it. So if you break open the natural gas, you get hydrogen, but you get carbon dioxide. Okay, okay. So what you then do is you capture the CO2 and you bury it in somewhere like Kim's store. Okay. I I'd love to start taking questions from people. So do put your questions in the Q&A box here, just on, on the right-hand side or um, top uh, right-hand side of your screen, depending where your Q&A box is. Um, and we can put your questions to our panelists. Kim, I I've got to come back to you. I mean, um, I can't help but note in your introduction, you mentioned um, Total, Shell, um, I was, I was at Equinor, I can't remember the name of the other company, yes, Equinor. Um, that prompts one to say, look, isn't this, you know, the big polluters, you know, using this as a, as a license to keep, keep producing oil um, and the environmentalists would really just prefer to see, see them shut down altogether. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, how can I answer that? I, I think, um, uh, first of all, uh, you know, I have my background in Shell. Um, uh, I've been with, with Shell for about 15 years. Um, and um, uh, personally, I, I, I believe and I uh, see that Shell is quite progressive in this area, uh, in the energy transition. Um, now, at the same time, also uh, producing oil and gas. So yes, you're, you're right. However, you know, we also sit on a lot of competence and expertise uh, that is critical in order to solve some of these issues that we're faced with, uh, and especially on the storage side. So uh, uh, you have to remember that the oil and gas companies have been uh, producing oil and gas from reservoirs deep uh, uh, offshore uh, or, or uh, you know, deep down uh, in underground. Uh, and the subsurface structures is something that the oil and gas industry know better than anyone, really. Uh, and it's the same technology that is being used to store CO2. You need to know the subsurface, you need to know the geology, uh, and you need to be able to ensure that it's done safely. And uh, 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 therefore, you know, what these companies are doing is that they're taking, they're finding solutions uh, to some of the climate issues that we're faced with uh, and um, uh, are able to kind of use the knowledge, the experience uh, uh, to change uh, the, the energy system as we know it today. There must be numerous environmental issues with storing CO2 below the seabed. Well, um, 
no so uh, but but it and, and another element is also that it's 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 expensive to do so so you need you need capital in order to to be able to do it it's not something that just any geologist just can do you need uh it's it's expensive you need to do seismic exploration you need a, a drilling rig and uh, you need to to drill that well um in our case um we uh, our storage location is um about 100 kilometers offshore uh it's on uh, uh 300 meter uh water depth in the area uh and our reservoir is located 2600 meters so 2.6 kilometers um, uh, be, be below um, uh, the, the, the bottom of the sea. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, drilling those wells, that's, uh, uh, that's a complex operation. It's not just something anyone can do. On the environmental front, I, I just have to throw in there that uh, it, it's, it's, it's easy. Some of the sites that are potential for storage, I mean, they all need to be carefully monitored and there's a lot of research going on about this. But I think don't think about it as just being underneath the, the seabed, just kind of in, in, in among the mud. This is this is two and a half kilometers down. This is in the rock. This is in the heart of the earth. And, and also bear in mind that, that this is going into some in some cases, it's going to places that used to hold oil and gas. So it, it, that, that had been there for for tens of millions of years before it was actually taken back out again. So it's not like a, a, a landfill or a waste dump. It's actually pumping it deep into the rock in the earth where it actually came from in the first place. I'm going to start taking some questions. Paul Jackson is there. Um, Paul Jackson, Paul is in the UK. Um, Paul, go ahead with your question. Go on, Paul. We can hear you, go on. Paul, your microphone's open, but can't manage to hear you. Go on. Don't, I think we we have um, a slight issue there with the sound. So, Paul, I'm going to ask your question for you. You said so that uh, are they using former oil wells um, to, um, to store them in the North Sea? I mean that you've you've just gone through that um, description there, Kim. But it's not just um, oil wells as well. I think there's there's, there's a way of storing it in in the rock as well and basalt, Kim. So in, in, in our case, we have a saline aquifer, as it's called, uh, where we're storing the, the CO2. Uh, uh, it can also be stored in um, uh, reservoirs that have previously held oil and gas. OK, great. And that is being done uh, several places around the world. OK, uh, we've got another question from Victoria Barclay. Victoria. Go ahead, Victoria, just open your microphone. I'm having a bit of a microphone trouble here this evening. Is on, Victoria, I think you're on mute. Yeah, you got bottom. Try try opening bottom. Probably boss, if you're on a laptop, might be on my bottom left hand. There you go, Victoria. Go ahead. Great. Uh, sorry, I know you're describing um, these areas where the the um, carbon can be captured, but I still can't quite visualise um, where it is. I mean, I frequently visit Sutherland and uh, Scotland. And that has the second largest um, yeah. bog land area in the whole world. Now, peat obviously is a natural carbon um, capture environment, and it's quite, quite fabulous and beautiful. Except at the moment, it seems to be uh, littered now with wind turbines, which is my one objection to the presence of wind turbines up there. Um, it's displacing carbon capture, the very thing that uh, the wind turbines are trying to do or intending to do, they are actually releasing. Okay, Gabriel, deal with that. You were smiling there. I think you, you've got some idea. It's gorgeous. The, the peatlands are gorgeous and yeah. they are also performing this amazing service. So um, I, I, uh, I was smiling at the thought of the lovely landscape as well. I'm with you there on, on that, Victoria. Also, just to make a comment, when I talked about uh, removals, natural removals, I, I talked about trees as being a kind of shorthand, and I really shouldn't do that. Nobody should, because there's also that the, there are there are uh, peatlands, there are the the seaweed. There's lots of other ways in which nature takes up carbon for us, and we need it all. And the comment that I was going to make is that. 
nature has actually been been very kind to us. We've been putting all this CO2 pollution into the air and into the oceans, and it's been taking it up for us and actually soaking it up for us. So the oceans have taken up something like a third of all the all the CO2 that we have emitted and taken them in. And that's why the oceans are acidifying, because uh, that makes it into an acid. But also uh, natural ecosystems all around the world have been taking up CO2 for us. And one of the things that really worries me is that that's not going to go on forever because the more CO2 we put in the air, the more the climate is changing, the more it's heating up, the more the forests are burning, the more the peatlands are burning. And the more we cram CO2 into the ocean, the more, it, the more chance it starts to release it again. And that's one of the reasons that we need to have the removals so that we can both accelerate our action to get this stuff out of the air and also be ready so that we can balance this if nature starts giving back. Kim, can you just describe um, the Climeworks sort of machinery? What does it actually look like? Victoria's asking, you know, what does fabricated carbon capture actually look like? Because you couldn't quite envisage it. So just describe what that fan looks like and how that process actually works before you actually get the liquid and store it away. Yeah, the the uh, Climeworks uh, technology. Uh, well, I, I I guess it it, it looks like um, fans stacked on top of each other, uh, and and uh, you, you can think of maybe twenty or thirty of them, uh, and 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 then they they kind of suck the air in through uh, their their machinery, and and inside there are filters uh, that filters out the the CO two. It's um, uh, there, there are photos on it on their website, so climeworks.com, um, uh, I believe, uh, and also on our website, norlights.com, uh, and, and then you can, can have a look at it. Um, but uh, basically, the, the CO2 itself is, is not, you know, you can't see it. Um, um, but what you need to do is to, to liquefy it and, uh, uh, before it's in, injected. Uh, uh, and, and or, or transported. Um, uh, so, so that's something that needs to be done as well. Now, some arguments uh, that have been used is that um, against that particular technology is that it's very energy intensive. And, uh, and, and that is true, which is why they're looking at Norway, uh, because Norway is, is basically 90, 95% renewable energy and has been so for, for, for yeah, um, uh, uh, the last century, really, um, uh, because of the hydropower. So, um, so, so therefore, they can can do uh, uh, this without uh, uh, kind of any any uh, other type of emissions in the process. Um, Pamela Dixon, um, you've got a sort of good question that sort of follow, follow, follows up on this. Go ahead, Pamela. Microphone, bottom left hand side of your sc of your screen. <laughs> There you go, please. I, <laughs> go on. I'm looking at what, what did it was like, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now, okay, yeah. Just yes, say where um, you are, just say, sorry, Yeah, my um, question was, okay. I am in Miami, Florida. And um, my question is how, how safe is the storage of the of captured carbon? I'm not, Sure, what form it's stored in. I, I understand. How does this compare with the another popular solution I hear about these days of dimming the sun? You know, is uh, how how is this compared with that? Uh, is it equally as likely, or you know, and how long term a solution? Okay, let, we, you broke up just at the beginning, but I've got your question here, and you said it's very iconic to take oil out and put it back in. But how safe is the storage? Is it vulnerable to earthquakes? How long term a solution is it? Um, and I love your thing about how does it compare with dimming the sun? I don't know about dimming the sun. Gabriel, can you tell us all about that? I, mean, I can tell you all about that, but I, I think I, I should uh, actually hand over to, to Kim on the how safe is it and how long does it stay there. Um, but, but I will make a comment about dimming the sun, which is that um, that that's goes into a box marked geoengineering. It's kind of can we actually you know we we've, we've caused all this problem. Can we now fix it by putting little mirrors in the in the in the into space or or blasting uh, little particles into the air so that we can make clouds and all that kind of stuff? Um, I am extremely terrified by all of those suggestions. 
um, uh, on the general basis that humankind, while we can be extremely clever and inventive and we can technologically advanced, very often when we start messing with something to try and fix it, it turns into something of a Laurel and Hardy movie, where it's another fine mess you've got us into, right? And, and just to, to explain that, the guy who invented the chemicals that nearly destroyed the ozone layer, a lovely man called Thomas Midgley, a brilliant inventor, and everybody loved him, and he was trying to help. He was trying to make a chemical that was completely harmless, and therefore he made something that nearly destroyed all life on Earth. And well, by the way, can I take that idea, that take that thought, and throw that at Kim? This is a <laughs> long, hardy solution. You don't know what you're doing. This could be more dangerous than. Ah, that. No, 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 you can't. Actually, I'm not going to let you do that because uh, carbon capture does not go into that box. That's the most important point. That it's not actually a mm -hmm. geoengineering. It's not saying we've done something, let's do something else and do something else and get an unintended consequence. It's saying we've put something in the air that's causing harm. So, oops, let's take it back out again. That's all we're, all we're saying. It's not a geoengineering solution. It is a take back out what we should never have put in there in the first place. But it's you know. pretty complex in terms of its engineering. Kim, how safe is it? Well, it, it, it's safe and it's been done for decades and uh, um, uh, monitored uh, for, for, for decades as well. Now, in, in, in Norway, um, uh, all of these processes are closely monitored by the authorities and the regulators. Now, what we're doing is that we're, we're storing uh, the CO2 in a deep underground sandstone reservoir. Uh, it's offshore. Uh, and uh, uh, the reservoir properties have been tested and thoroughly evaluated, um, both by the very skilled uh, geologists in, uh, in, in, in the partner companies, uh, as, as well as by the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. Uh, and they've concluded that the, the reservoir is well suited for injection and storage of CO2. Um, uh, all, all of the, the project partners in, in our particular project have decades of experience in safe CO2 storage in Norway uh, and in Canada and in Australia and, and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, we've had access to, to the best possible expertise when evaluating the, the properties. Uh, now, in, in, uh, there, there are two uh, offshore fields in Norway, Sleipner and Snövit, uh, which have been storing CO2 for, for the last 24 years. Uh, it's been um, uh, studied very thoroughly um, also, you know, because we need knowledge, we need um, uh, kind of to, to learn how does the CO2 behave once it's been injected, um, uh, because it, it won't kind of sit in one place, it will migrate in a reservoir, uh, uh, so it will move. Um, uh, but, but that doesn't really matter much. The important thing is that you identify a reservoir where you have a good solid cap rock, as it's called. And, and now we're going into the geology, and I probably shouldn't do that because I'm not a geologist, but, but basically that cap rock is preventing uh, uh, any CO2 from uh, moving out of uh, the structure uh, uh, where it's meant to stay. And uh, in terms of earthquakes, now, well, first of all, we, there, there are, you know, this is uh, not an, an, an earthquake prone area, so, uh, so it's not a, a, an issue here, but they're doing CO2, or looking at at least, I don't know if they're actually doing it, but uh, CO2 storage in, in California as well, where, where there are um, plenty of earthquakes, and, uh, and, and I'm sure they, they've looked at all of these things. I, I think you know um, um, uh, that um, uh, the you know the 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 regulators and the geologists working this uh, would not be willing to take any risk with regard to these type of processes. Uh, Ken, that sounds a bit like um, trust the science. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being yeah, well. Not sucky there. That's yeah. No, I, 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 <laughs> okay. So. so uh, I, I think that the, the fact that it's been done for, for, for decades and uh, um, uh, successfully and safely is, uh, is, is an important point to get across. Gabriel, we, we, what were you going to say? Yes, uh, I, 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 I can hear it. Uh, uh, when I did a project for three years, my team and I interviewing lots of people about how they felt about CCS and why. And there's a lot of suspicion. And almost everybody within the industry said, you don't need to worry about storage. It's safe. We've got it. And almost everyone outside said, I'm worried about storage. And there's this kind of big 
fault line between the two of them and like they're ready to make an earthquake and, and I was smiling because uh, the other point about this is that there are some places that will be suitable there are some places that will be not this is not something we can afford to make a mistake on because already there's so much suspicion around carbon capture that if there were one big leak then that would queer the whole pitch so mm -hmm. the, the, you can see that there's a tension not just because you can trust the scientists but because people want to preserve their work so where, where does this suspicion come from I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around that I mean what, what... actually no I have to say something important yeah. about the whole the, and this is going to be very important to the whole story which is we're still we're talking about this and we're behaving as if we have a choice so do we want storage or do we not do we want cake or do we want a brownie? And the point is we don't have a choice. We have to find very large scale storage for this stuff somewhere. It's too late to do anything else. So what we have to do is figure out how to do it right with the best possible attention. I just wanted to chuck that in because people are still saying, I'd like it if it was purple. Well, well, the 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 um, the Titanic is bearing down on the iceberg. So um, <laughs> just to chuck that in. Now, what did you actually want to ask me? I, I've I've forgotten now. <laughs> <We've done. laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the, this the scepticism and I, I, what, why is there so much? Um, I mean, at the, from both from the env environmentalist point of view, why is there so much scepticism about carbon capture? Well, I, I've spoken to my team and I have spoken to just. Uh, uh, probably about 300 people on this now and a lot of them from NGOs and from from places that are very I understand the suspicion so think about it as you're saying that first of all it's it's this whole um technology where it, it, the only people that can actually do it are the ones that have caused the problem in the first place the bad guys the oil and gas companies then it's big it's industrial it's 19th century it's not kind of lovely and natural and then on top of that um uh, it, it 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 didn't we try that and it doesn't work and it's not it's not renewable and so it doesn't feel Renewable energy has had decades of having good moral authority associated with it. Um, and then also carbon capture and storage is associated with coal, it's associated with oil. Uh, one, one guy said to me, the only thing it's got going for it is at least it's not nuclear. Um, and, and another one said, the only thing that carbon capture has going for it is it can save the world. Apart from that, nothing. <laughs> That's why they don't like it. Not much, is it? No. <laughs> um, the, the, the fans that um, Climeworks produce they, they do look like um, wind turbines, but within a frame. Um, it's like a sort of a, a, an old fashioned fan in, in a window. And I was just wondering whether you could, you could see it in a more sort of urban setting on a small scale setting where people, people could have much smaller units. Yeah, I'm sure that's possible. I, I, I don't know if, um, you know, it's gonna be quite expensive. So it's not something that you would probably put in your garden, but um. I'm, I'm sure, you know, as, as the cost is, is coming down, you know, maybe in the future, that's something that we all do. OK, we've got a, a, a good um, question and surprise, surprise, a comment from Andy Mendes. Go ahead, Andy. Yes, I, I could keep you going for a bit. A, a question really for Kim. Um, I was a chemist many, many years ago uh, before they invented climate change, probably before they invented carbon. But I just do wonder whether you've looked at any alternatives to actually injecting liquid carbons, uh, pressurized carbon, like turning it into something benign, like a carbonate or something like that. I guess you'd need some very, very big slag heaps would be my question. But, but my observa two quick observations, Nicholas, and then I'll go away for a bit. Um, you asked about why is there all this skepticism about carbon capture? Well, just look at the sort of scepticism that was generated on smoking for years and years and years, and the sort of scepticism that's being generated on vaccine um, mm -hmm. uh, hesitancy at the moment. And I wouldn't, I would suggest to you that some of the big oil producers and some of the big oil companies are actually working very hard indeed to try and still to deny climate change, let alone the need for carbon capture. So that's that. But my final comment, and then I promise I'll shut up, is. Uh, we talk quite a bit, even, even Gabrielle talked a, a bit about carbon capture has been quite expensive. What nobody seems to be looking at and, and balancing, uh, and I think Sylvia Farr outweighs the cost of this, is how much would it cost, for instance, to uproot London and move, and move it 10 metres above the new sea level? Uh, and, and my understanding is that we're already talking, planning to move, I think it's Jakarta, lock stock and barrel to a new island because they're running out of that island I mean, the, the costs of not doing this so are so much higher in orders of magnitude than the cost of trying to do something 
and yet our glorious leaders don't seem to have quite took it. I'd be very interested in Gabrielle's view on how on earth we turn that understanding around. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I think, Andy, you were echoing what Gabriel was saying um, just earlier. Um, but but um, I think both of you are saying that sort of governments are, are getting more in tune to this, but it's just a, a awareness of the issue, Gabriel. It is. Um, I, I'm actually I'm a, a former chemist myself as well, Andy. So um, so nice to meet you. It's always good to find. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, so on on that question, um, uh, I, I, I I'm I've really heartily tired of people saying yes, but who will pay for it? I think not enough people have actually noticed what what uh, what Andy just said, uh, and and the way that I've managed to shut them up lately is by saying, can you imagine the scenario? Yeah, you know, a vaccine would be nice, but who's going to pay for it and that really is where we are on this and where we're going to be on this and there's a reason that the hedgies are now saying my god well, the, the the betting on carbon prices in europe is a one-way bet going upwards right now and, and that's one of the things that i was going to say about the, the whole financing of it when i've talked to so many senior executives and said i thought that when covid hit you were going to go cold on climate and in fact you've accelerated why in almost every case they said the investors haven't let up the pressure in fact they've put more pressure on and that's because they've seen where the where the risks are the unpriced risks are and mm. they've also seen the untapped opportunities so it's just it's a seismic shift it's mainstreaming of this in the investment world and that's really making a difference can, can, can you talk a bit more about the financing of this because this is really important and again i mean i don't want to be um you know sound pessimistic and critical all the time but if you think of um carbon credits that market got heavily discredited so there is there is um you know hesitancy yes at the same time as you you say there's a huge amount of demand that the financing should be there for it the, the thing that's making the difference and we've talked to the, the i've just been doing a project for the last six months specifically looking at what's stopping finance getting to carbon capture projects um and and the answer there's a whole bunch of answers but what i think is interesting is that when we were actually asking people what are the models that will make the difference uh, I'm, I'm i'm also tired of people saying either we need a carbon price or government should do something and this time i didn't get that answer this time i started getting grown-ups being more serious about what well, we can do this but we could do that and in many cases make a buyer's collective what do you actually need you need a revenue stream so that you can get the debt line so that you can make that so we need to to aggregate demand in this way we, so it, it's, it's a much more grown-up conversation about how you get money flowing that way and and the other comment that I'd make about it which I think is another game changer is the whole race to net zero so 18 months ago it was nowhere almost nobody was setting net zero targets apart from the crazy hippie ones and now governments all over the world are doing it, organizations, corporations all over the world are doing it. And now basically, if you don't have a net zero by 2050 target, you're not at the table. And if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so I think it's, it's very, very dramatic change again. Something like 70% of the, of the world's emissions are now generated in places that have a net zero by 2050 or 2060 target. And net zero means that you're gonna to have to find a way to pay for this. And one last comment on the financing. And I think we, I'm, I'm often getting asked the question, isn't this just gonna encourage people to, to carry on polluting and get away with it? And the answer is that this is way too expensive to encourage anybody. It's always cheaper not to emit in the first place. So everyone, when they realize they're gonna to have to do that, the investors are putting the pressure on, the net zero targets are out there, they have to do it. They're always gonna find the cheapest ways first. And this is much more of a last resort. So that, that was the criticism made of the carbon credits market is that you know, people could still pollute and it wasn't really verifiable how um, this project, you know, somewhere remote that couldn't really be inspected was actually reducing carbon and you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere. So that was where, where there was skepticism about carbon credits. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's kind of a, like, I, I don't feel so guilty now. And, and maybe it will happen over there, but maybe it won't. But at least I don't feel so guilty. It was a bit like, you know, buying, buying, paying off your sins, getting a plenary indulgence bought from the church. Mm. Whereas, whereas now this mechanism, which says, you know, you, you, I put out a turn, you remove a turn and we go back to zero. I buy your credit. It's all measurable. It's all verifiable. And it's really, it's releasing the market to be clever again. And I think that's what we really need in this. I, I know there are people who are listening into this call who are much more financially qualified than I am. And they may have more questions for you about financing, how the financing works. So do, um, I'm, I'm thinking of someone called McMahon, um, if McMahon's listening in, um, uh, do, do, do chip in. Um, Hilary Matthews has got a question. Go ahead, Hilary. 
Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Go on. Uh, well, gosh, since I wrote my question, so much has changed. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> um, the, the one thing I'm thinking about is that Norway is way ahead of the rest of the world. I read an article recently saying that most of your cars are electric or a much, much higher percentage than anywhere else. Um, and that you have, as you said, a lot of green energy. And I'm wondering whether you get frustrated about the rest of Europe uh, not being so far behind Norway. I watched the thriller series Occupied that may ring some bells with people who've seen that, about how far ahead Norway is from the rest of the world. But also, how does it, how does it play out with other countries like America and or African countries that are burning coal and so on. And one final question, I lived in Alaska for 20 years and I'd like you to comment as to whether Exxon has jumped on board, uh, as you say Shell has, has Exxon doing anything good? Thank you. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I can't possibly, uh, you know, comment on that. But it, it's, um, you know, Exxon is also involved in carbon capture and storage. Yes, uh, and 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 I know that they've got a, a, a couple of really big projects in the US, actually. So, in in fact, many of the the oil and gas companies are working together through what is called the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. Uh, and have made commitments through that initiative, uh, both with regard to uh, reducing methane emissions, um, carbon capture and storage, and various other things, and are also funding new technology. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so I think a lot is is, is happening there, uh, and and the oil and gas companies cannot uh, ignore um, uh, the need for these technologies, uh, and then uh, they don't. But I, I think, you know, in Europe, yes, um, uh, definitely more happening here. Um, uh, but um, in, in terms of Norway electric cars, yeah, I drive an electric car and I, I, I will never go back to, uh, uh, to, to a diesel or petrol driven car. It's fantastic. I love my car. Uh, it's not a Tesla, but it's fantastic. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I think, uh, yeah, it, it, it happened because you know, because of government subsidies. Um, uh, so, so obviously the, the, the authorities uh, need to, to be able to, uh, to uh, kind of incentivize green technology um, uh, and until, you know, uh, it, they don't need to anymore uh, and hopefully we'll be there quite soon. I think we are very soon on electric vehicles. We're running slightly long time and we've got a lot of questions and a lot of really good questions here. So I want to try and get through them. Richard Murphy, um, uh, this is to, to, to Gabriel. Go ahead, Richard, if you can be pretty quick, please, brief. Oh, hello, it's Linda, actually. But um, oh, hello, Linda. I was going to talk about... Linda, can you just say, because both, both um, you and uh, Richard have a political background, so just say roughly where you stand. Um, well, we're both Liberal Democrats um, here in the UK, so, um, yeah that's where we're sort of coming from um but in the uk we're trying to get the climate and ecological emergency bill passed and one of its goals is to ensure that the uk first and foremost reduces its greenhouse gas emissions um, and i do feel that carbon capture does does give the big oil companies the excuse to delay taking the steps they ultimately need to take you know they're sort of they're still going to carry on taking oil and gas out and then putting the carbon in and i think this is just delaying any progress on that front Gabriel, I mean, that's a fair comment. They are. I mean, the, our appetite for oil is still huge. Our appetite for oil is still huge. And I think uh, what I'll say about this, I completely understand that point of view. And it does. It seems ridiculous. We took it out. We put it back in again. And uh, and, and I think a lot of people that feel really uncomfortable, it really is like letting the bad guys get away with it at the end of the movie. And who wants to see that happen? And so I, but, but, you know, but more, more, in a more sophisticated way, I can completely see the point that will this, there's a call this a moral hazard. It's just going to let people get away with it and carry on not making the change we need until it really is too late for all of us. And I don't think the answer is yes. And here's why, because this is not saying let's just bring out the oil and then let's just put the, put the uh, uh, carbon back and, and we can carry on doing it like that. Um, 
the carbon capture is applicable, is, is, in, is vital, is necessary in two specific areas. You remember from what I said at the beginning, it's avoided emissions from industry. So it's cement, steel, chemicals, all of those things that we need, and we don't really have other solutions for. So carbon capture is stopping that happening. It's not, this isn't about oil and gas companies getting away with it. It's saying, how can we keep industry in play and stop the emissions? And the other thing is, it's to get very large scale removals. It's capturing from the air and burying it into the ground. That's not letting the, the, the oil and gas companies get away with anything. And if you say, well, they'll just produce oil and then pay to remove it, that would be crazy to do because it's actually more expensive to remove it than you get from producing the oil in the first place. It doesn't make economic sense. So I, I think that you don't have the right direction in terms of the economics for that argument to fly anymore. We've, we've passed that point now, it's too late. And the final comment I make, I literally have started a, a, an improvisation course an online improvisation course with a comedian. Why did I do that? Because I want to learn not just for myself, but for everyone I talk to how to say yes and yes and, because right now we need it all on the table. We need to be reducing emissions everywhere we possibly can and we need to be removing it. And if somebody says, do we need X where X is any solution right now? I say, yes, bring it on and we might just make it. Okay, great. Um, uh... I've got two um, questions that I want to have back to back. So Marty Ryan, please, followed by Diane Cook. So go ahead, Marty. Well, thank you. This is fascinating. Um, I'm in the US, uh, but one of my questions is, what is it to keep the um, carbon dioxide from being somehow released from underground? You talked about a cap rock over the top that is kind of the lid on the container, but with all the drilling equipment that we've had over this years and years, somebody could drill through that. So how do you, how do you protect that? And then my second question is, is, is there a profit uh, making opportunity in this carbon capture? There has to be, doesn't there? There has to be. I mean, let's bring in, I want Diane Cook to ask her question as well, because it's a follow this up. So go ahead, Diane. It wasn't so much a, a, a question, more a comment. When you were talking about um, people being scared about injecting gases into reservoirs and then taking them out again, I just made the comment that households in the United Kingdom have been using gas, natural gas, um, pipe, uh, piped in or shipped in from other countries and other fields stored in an empty gas field, depleted field called the rough field, and there are others in the North Sea, and then it's come out again. So um, Kim, your point, there's a very long 50 plus years tradition in the oil and gas business of injecting um, gases into reservoirs, and they're very stable. And there's a good example of people have been gaily, you know, boiling their egg, eggs with, um, on their stoves with um, gas that came from Qatar, for example. Um, uh, Marty, I've got to say, you're um, nice to hear your cat. Um, Bertie, I wish I could move my camera. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Bertie, Bertie the dog, the, our miniature schnauzer is just here, but he's very well behaved. It doesn't make any noise um, while, while we're on air. Kim, that, that is a market. The market's very important to this, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, the market is not there yet, um, but uh, you know, in 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 order for uh, in, in industrial companies in Europe to position themselves for the future that is not far away, uh, they need to start acting now. Uh, so they are willing to pay uh, for this, and uh, for this service that we're offering, and uh, um, uh, obviously we don't expect to make any profit in, in at least for the next 10 years, but maybe in 10 years from now, maybe from 2030, we will start making money uh, and, uh, and, and then maybe it's going to be a profitable business. But now we do it because we have to, because they, they, there is no way around it. And, you know, we have a responsibility as well because, you know, we, we know this technology. And I thought Diane's uh, uh, comment around uh, the, the rough field, which was fantastic, and I didn't know about that. Um, but yes, indeed, uh, th that kind of says a little bit also about the, the um, you know, that this is new, not new technology. Um, uh, the geologists, they've, they know how to do this. They've done it for 
um, probably uh, uh, yeah many decades already um, not always uh, only in Norway but also elsewhere uh, the, the, there was this question about drilling drilling into the reservoir and uh, a question about the cap rock now um, uh, obviously when so the, 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 the reservoirs are um, uh, kind of divided into licenses and this is the authorities role here so they manage this very carefully you know so um, uh, no one will ever be able to uh, or allowed to drill into a reservoir where CO2 is being stored. Um, now, should it happen, uh, it, it wouldn't really cause, you know, it's it's very technical and, and but the drilling engineers will tell you that uh, they will, obviously, whenever they drill anything, they they will be able to, to protect um, uh, uh, whatever is in there uh, and, and do it safely. So you know, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Um, I, I want to get in um, just two. I know we're running out of time here, but I'm desperate to get two really good questions in here. Um, so Tom, um, Tom Wood, Thomas Wood, um, no relation. Nice nudge. Um, go ahead, Tom. Um, I was just interested. Um, you're towards the more establishment end of the uh, fighting against global warming. I mean, how do you view Extinction Rebellion? Gabriel, what do you think of Extinction Rebellion? <laughs> I want to say, wash your mouth out, Tom Wood. How dare you call me establishment? <laughs> Pistols at dawn, I say. Um, I have, I am, I'm proud to say, um, embraced one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion on stage in front oh. of 400 of uh, Weatherby's private bank's richest clients when she just told them that they uh, should get themselves arrested if they wanted to do something about climate change. So um, I'll talk to anybody. And basically, I, I, I was serious when I said we need everything on the table and everyone around the table. And uh, they, you know, I, I have I have fundamental disagreements with some of them. And I have fundamental disagreements with some of the people I occasionally work with in oil and gas companies as well. But broadly speaking, um, I think um, uh, the they're, they're, they're great fun, I have to tell you. But um, they're, 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 in many cases, the way that they're trying to shake people up has really made a difference. And so it sort of drives them into the armors of the more reasonable ones, I suppose you might say. Right. Well, um, no, actually, just a very, very quick comment. I felt, I felt very bad because Andy asked a question about a chemistry question about, about turning CO2 into rock. And it's a brilliant question. I was really sorry not, that, that, not to get a chance to answer it because that's actually happening. And it's really just started in the last six months to take off this whole field of mineralization. So an alternative, sorry, Kim, to storing in geological storage is actually turning CO2 to rock on the surface. And it might actually be a solution for large scale cleanup of mine tailings. And so lots of mining companies are starting to look at it right now. So completely on the money, I don't care how former you say you are as a chemist, you're on the ball. Very good. And, and we, we need do, all um, the technologies. Yeah. <laughs> we do. <laughs> yes, um, I think we talked about basalt as well at the beginning of the program. Um, Howard Gatiss is there. Um, Howard, are you happy to say what you do for a living? Um, I am Nicholas. I sell coal, as you very well know. And this is coal for power stations, which is one of those uh, useful things which sort of uh, keeps the electricity on uh, and allows people to uh, charge their iPads even when it's not sunny and, and it's not windy. Uh, you know, Nicholas, because you've seen the comment that, that I have made, uh, that it is nice to have uh, two panellists who talk complete sense uh, and do so with, uh, with, you know, with, with, with such a, uh, a warmth and uh, a, a nice way of doing it. I mean, I was expecting that, uh, that you would have on uh, today, you know, that the trendy lefties who uh, who are exactly the sort of people that Gabriel describes uh, so politely. Um, but, uh, you know, I was, and I was going to make the point that the International Energy Agency, the IEA, in all its scenarios, uh, says that the only way that we get through this, along with exactly as Gabriel says, all of the other measures, the only way we get through this is with carbon capture and storage. It also says we'll need coal for a considerable period of time, but that's perhaps for another day. Uh, is that is that? I mean, do, I do want to get that in. Do we still need to burn coal, Gabriel? Uh, define need. Um, uh, what, what I would say in, in response to that, and, and thanks for, for the charming responses for what we've been talking about, I am just so tired of the saints and sinners narrative. 
because we really have to grow up and realize we are all in this together. We have one planet and we are all living on it. And the only way that we are going to continue to make a living, any of us, is to solve this problem. So it's not mine and yours and this and that and his and hers. And it's certainly not your fault, your fault, your fault. If we waste our time doing that, we won't fix it. And if we don't fix it, we all go down in flames. That's the only way to guarantee that everybody loses. So I just have no patience. I'll talk to anyone about this, but I have no patience with whose fault is it. Let's worry about that later. Nicholas, I should just add that uh, the, the music that you see in front of you, if you do, hmm. is the last page of Wagner's Götterdämmerung, where everything goes up in flames. <laughs> I, just had to point that out. <laughs> I didn't plan that, I promise. Uh, Aaron, thank you very much for that. That's brilliant. Very good. There we must leave it. Thank you very much indeed. Kim Bai Brun um, from Northern Lights and uh, Dr. Gabriel Walker author and um, climate strategist. Thank you all very much indeed. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. Thank you.